So, hello everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to the second session um, of day one in a 22nd STC India annual conference. So the session now is titled Strategic, Strategic Writing for UX. And uh, a brief about the session. So content professionals make measurable impact when we align with customer goals and business priorities from the beginning. In this presentation, Tori is uh, going to explore the history and future of UX content in software industry and going to demystify some of the critical relationships among a variety of content that we develop and also discuss how UX writers work ac across stakeholders to help our customers and business uh, meet or exceed their goals. So uh, let me also formally introduce uh, Tori to all of you. Uh, this is the first time that Tori is attending any uh, STC India session. So Tori, a warm welcome to you. And thank you so much for uh, accepting our invite to uh, be one of the speakers. And uh, speaking on day one, uh, your topic absolutely aligns with our, um, with our team. So we are looking forward to your session. So we, about uh, Tori, so it's not really often that you bump into a UX writer. For example, UX writer itself, the designation itself is quite uh, uh, not very, uh, frequently that you come across that designation itself and who has a rich experience to share from her uh, current work experience at google and also her uh, past experience working at microsoft and at a, and few other uh, companies where she has been a strong advocate of ux so she also helps teams solve business and customer problems using ux content she has written inclusive and accessible Consumer and professional experiences for Google, offer UP, Xbox, uh, Microsoft account, Windows apps, privacy, and Microsoft education. Tori's high intensity speaking style was refined in the cubicle of teaching chemistry. So just for you uh, to know the background, but even her most engaging lectures no longer require eye protection. She blogs on Medium and shares her ideas on I'm sure all of you might have uh, got connected to her on LinkedIn. She has co-authored the UX Writing Fundamentals Curriculum for Seattle's uh, School of Visual Concepts, uh, teaching there since 2016. Tori has a bachelor's degree in physics from um, UAW and a master's in curriculum and instruction from Seattle University, where she is based out of, and has done freelance fiction writing, home health care work, Poster parenting, high power rocketry, marketing communications, designed the pill the pill sorter, and taught high school science for nine years. Tori's range of experience helps her empathize with a broad range of people, and she brings that empathy to her uh, products and her teams. So Tori is uh, the best-selling um, uh, author of the best-selling uh, book uh, titled "Strategic Writing for UX." So Tori, over to you. And uh, Hemant is going to be the moderator for your Q&A session. So all of you, a request to all the attendees as you are attending the session, you can keep on sharing your questions and Hemant will take a note. And I'm also there to support. Tori, all to you. We are all eager to look forward to uh, hearing your session. Welcome once again. Thank you so much, Rajiv. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me here at STC India. I am uh, working on sharing my screen so that you can see what I have come to talk to you about today. There we go. That looks about right. Excellent. I am um, here to talk to you today about, uh, I need to move the chat screen out of my way here. Um, a little bit of, of Zoom rearranging as you share your screen, everything changes. What I am here to talk to you about today, um, as Rajiv said, is that software has always required content. Uh, I want to talk about that history. I want to talk about what UX writing is as a portion of that content that software has always needed. I want to talk to you about the impacts that that, so that UX writing can make and also about the the nitty gritty processes of how that happens. And then I believe there'll be time at the end for questions that Hemant is here to help us with. So let's jump right in. Software has always required content. 
Let me tell you about this device. This was a device used for the US Census in 1890. In the US, the US Constitution mandates that the census be taken every 10 years and each person counted. And in the 1800s, that meant a person on horseback going village to village, um, writing down people's names and how many people there were. Counting people like that is slow, but even slower is when the person on horseback comes back and all of those names from all of those notebooks need to be added up. And whether they're men or women or children and all of those details that they could capture. They knew that the country was growing so fast that by the time the 1880 census was finished, they knew before 1890 that the 1890 fit, uh, census couldn't be finished before 1900, before the next one needed to begin. They needed a faster way to tabulate those results. So they, uh, that's where we got Hollerith's tabulating machine. And here's how it worked. It read punch cards. It read them very quickly by running current wherever there was a hole in the, the card. So there were people who were usually women who punched the cards to encode the census data. So people would still come in with their notebooks full of names. And then these women would take those notebooks and use this punch apparatus. The card goes in the top and then the handle punches through uh, according to this guide. Let's look at that guide. Every hole of this guide is labeled and all of those labels are text. This is user interface text. The interface has always required text. There's also, of course, a seven page document of how the machine works. Technical writing like this is arguably the very first UX writing because even when devices didn't have user interfaces and for all of the people who would set up the machines and keep them running, who didn't necessarily need to use the punch card apparatus, they needed these technical documentations to function. Without content, computers don't work for people. The Hollerith tabulating machine was used in the 1890 and 1900 censuses. Of course, that's a long time ago, but was it really? Five of my great grandparents were counted with it. My parents knew them. They're in living memory. Computing is young. And I was young when I had a computer that looked like this. I was born in the 70s. And this is a picture of a Sanyo MBC 1150. In 1981, I had a Sanyo MBC 1250. It looked uh, very much the same. And this is what it looked like to use the MBC 1250. It's a green screen, lots of text. All of the interface is text. The, this GIF ex excerpted from a YouTube video shows how I would start up WordStar. This is the Microsoft Word or Google Docs of its day. To open a file, the top two thirds of the screen is text. Even while you're in the file, the top quarter of the screen is UX text. All of the interface is text. So most people like me didn't like the UI taking up so much of the screen. It, it was very limited screen to begin with. So companies sold these custom keyboard mats and you could turn off the UI um, and, and use it with those instructions still right in front of you. My, my dad didn't think they were a good use of money. I had to memorize all of those. So these keyboard mats were everywhere. It was an add-on, an extra part of the experience. I didn't have one, um, but it was okay. It has a lot of UX text here. Notice it has information hierarchy. It has the name of every command. It even has branding. But this is, this is kind of awful UX, right? This is UX writing. It's the UX text that makes it possible to use computers. But there was so much more that we could do. Along comes this guy. In 1985, I was writing school papers on my Sanyo MBC 1250. Steve Jobs, even before his black turtleneck, gave an interview with Playboy magazine, and he mentioned WordStar in that. Even while admitting that WordStar was the most popular word processing program, 
He made fun of its special incantations and its 400 pages of documentation. Steve was a marketing guy. He understood capturing people's attention with advertising. And he brought those advertising sensibilities to user experience. Those sensibilities in the 1980s in the US looked kind of like this. You lead with the message, very rare. And then you lead with the image, the, the big, they're trying to sell this big gas grill or chart, yeah, gas grill. Then they want to land that message if necessary by giving detail and persuasive content in a text box. But those text boxes come from this. Text used to actually be constrained to boxes. Lead or tin type would be composed together and jammed in tight to a frame. And those frames are real hard metal constraints, not pixels. So images and blocks of type can only be brought together easily if the writer stays in their text box. And more importantly, the design only works if the writer fills up their text box. Otherwise, the text couldn't be jammed in tight well enough. In graphics design classes, designers are still sometimes taught to design that, that there will be a text box and write the words later. But we can do a lot more now. These are some screens from GPEG. It is, uh, I do not work on this product. I, I am impressed by this product and I know who works on this product. Text boxes that you see all over the screen is where UX writers still do their most visible work. This is what people think of when we explain what UX writing is. We choose the words to use in the text boxes, working with illustrators, interaction designers, product owners, engineers, marketers, and more. There's power in these text boxes because they get people where they need to go. They convey the brand. They don't take up too much space or effort or time. But UX writers are no longer limited to these text boxes that other people give us. To get a view of that, let's take a broader view of what UX writing is and what other kinds of content is. So here is what a business is trying to do at its most basic level. They are trying to attract people to be interested in their products. They're trying to convert them into customers or users of their products. They want to onboard them into that experience, engage them so that they keep using it. And if anything ever breaks, they wanna support them so they come back for more. Most importantly, they wanna transform them into repeat customers or people who bring in their friends and family or recommend it to their next place of employment. This is what the business is trying to do. But that doesn't necessarily mean what the customer is trying to do. A customer isn't trying necessarily to be attracted. The customer is investigating, will this product work for me among all of the other products out there? So the customer is investigating, verifying, they're committing, whether that's signing their name uh, on a contract that buys licenses for an entire company, or just hitting get in an app store. So then they are setting it up, they're using it, they're fixing it. They may come to prefer the experience and they may come to be a champion of that experience to other people. And all along the way, our content works best if we meet the customer with what they're trying to do. So they, when they are investigating, we wanna give them ads and articles and tweets and posts so they know that our product is out there. When they are verifying and committing, we wanna show them the reviews and ratings that others have given us. We wanna show them the endorsements and we wanna show them the sales collateral, the information that we know will land them and help them commit to this product. Then when they're onboarding, we want to use the get started guide. We wanna provide them the get started guides, the help content, the information as you start up an experience that helps you get set up uh, and going and doing appropriately. And then here's where the titles, the buttons and the descriptions come in, sort of that meat and potatoes of UX writing. The alerts, the how-to content is still really important here because as people engage, they have different things they want to engage with in that product. It's also where the game and experience content is. If you use say Google Earth and you zoom in to a neighborhood you've never been to before, there is likely to be a, a lovely description of that neighborhood that gives you a flavor of it. 
And that kind of content uh, really helps you uh, love that product. Oops, I went backwards. When something breaks, and of course we don't want things to break, but we know that it will every once in a while, those alerts will let you know about it. Error messages will help you uh, keep going forward or let you know you need to find a different way. And the troubleshooting content will help you understand that journey. The, and then when we want people to come to prefer and champion it, we have sometimes in some apps, we have like profile ratings and badges, evidence for the person, for the user, that they have made an investment in using this app and it makes it stickier. It makes them want to use this one instead of having to start over and reinvest in a different platform. There's also forums and trainings and conferences and, and those are wildly important uh, pieces of content to get people into that champion mode. So here we have all these varieties of content and this is not exhaustive. This is just a huge, amount of content and a wide variety of content. And a lot of writers, myself included, hear from people a lot. Oh, well, you're a writer. Can't you write that for us? And I say to them, here is what I focus on. I focus really on the bottom half of this wheel. I am less involved uh, when I'm involved at all um, with the attracting people into the marketing funnel. I'm there to support them as they use the product. And that is what I, my content specializes in. And to, to uh, really get that content as good as it can be, I focus on two things. I focus on its voice, making it consistent and recognizable part of the brand. And I focus on usability, the ease of key behaviors. So making it easy for people to do what they came there to do, even for beginners. So let's start with voice. Here is uh, how MailChimp used to define their voice. And I love how they did this. This was about 2015 or so. MailChimp uh, defined its voice with these seven statements. The first word of each of these statements, fun, confident, informal, expert, is the target of where they wanted to be. That is what people should consider MailChimp content to be. All those seven things. But when aiming at those things, how does a writer know that they've gone too far? And that's what the last statement of each bullet is. They want it to be fun, but if you're going to miss the fun mark, at least make it not be silly. Make it confident, but not cocky. Informal, but not sloppy. Expert, but not bossy. This was a genius way to get everybody who needed to write content for MailChimp on board with the direction it could go. We did a similar thing um, with Xbox, clean, casual, and keep them playing. Here, we didn't need the but nots as much because inside Xbox, this is about 2013, we made these posters and hung them up in all of the buildings that we were making Xbox One. Uh, clean inside uh, the Xbox buildings um, meant all of the ways that we wanted to avoid being uh, and, and encourage our customers not to be other than clean on say Xbox Live. We want it to be tidy, we, we, that we had a strong understanding of what clean meant culturally inside of Xbox. We also knew what casual meant and we know that the opposite of casual is formal. We know that people put their Xboxes in their living rooms, sometimes in their bedrooms, in their spaces where they want to relax and have fun. So we knew about clean and casual. And the thing we really wanted to emphasize was every word in the console, every piece of content people saw as they were trying to use Xbox should keep them playing. And by playing, we meant games, videos, music, and more. Every word should be right there. So these posters were a visible reminder to not only teach this voice, but to remind them that they could email a small team of writers um, that could help them out with any string, any content they needed to land there. So what it really comes down to with voice is these things, concepts, the ideas you want to land, the vocabulary that you use to land those, the verbosity, how many words you use, the grammar, like is it passive or active? 
directive? Is it first person or third person or second person? And then also punctuation and capitalization for languages where capitalization is a thing or isn't otherwise controlled. These are the things that content professionals can use to alter people's uh, understanding of the voice. These are the levers we can pull. And this is how I set it up for OfferUp, which is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace similar to Craigslist, where people, one person offers to sell an item and another person offers to buy that item. And this is uh, people meeting up. This was uh, in the US only when I worked there. And what OfferUp did before I had joined actually was they had uh, defined these five principles. They wanted to be make sure they were simple and trustworthy, personal and neighborly, and also gratifying to use. This is what the product should be. These are the product principles. And I said, okay. I was the only UX writer in a startup then of about 120 people. And I said, here are the six things I can change. Let's think about what kind of ideas would help people understand that this is a simple app, that it's trustworthy, that it's personal, that it's neighborly and it's gratifying. Like with neighborly, just adding the concept sometimes that we are with each other, we are among our neighbors, we are together in our communities. That helped a lot. The vocabulary that we should use there, like for personal, we should always use the person's name or say you. And then sometimes shopper or buyer, depending on what role they had at that moment, uh, or seller, or just person. So using, defining the concepts and defining the vocabulary like that got us a lot of the way there. When it comes to verbosity, to be simple and trustworthy, you want to be brief, right? You want to just say it, say it plainly and get out of the way. In order to be personal or neighborly, sometimes we wanted to use more personal and community details and really land those ideas with them. And when things are gratifying, they need no explanation at all. So we should get out of the business of explaining why they should be so happy right now. Grammar should be simple statements. It should be asterisk free because we shouldn't be including caveats where you know it's an indicator that people should trust us less. For capitalization, I said sentence case for all of these. And sometimes let's break those rules. Let's break the capitalization rules to emphasize this celebratory moment. So here is how I, this whole page is how I presented to the team from the engineers to the support agents and, uh, and the executives, if we target this frame, uh, we will be on our uh, voice. These are the things we can change. And I've used this model in several other teams since, and I shared it in my book. So that's voice. Let's talk about usability. With usability, I want to talk about how it should be easy. It should be easy to do the thing, but how do we do that? And so I built this, these five categories out of uh, publicly available uh, research and research that I was privileged to consume inside Microsoft uh, and research I did at OfferUp and now that I use at Google. When we are talking about these five categories, I wanna go through them individually and talk about uh, each detail. So for accessibility, this is not all of accessibility. This is just how do we make UX text usable uh, in these categories. For accessible, it want, we want it to be available in the languages that the people using it are proficient in. This is especially challenging um, in countries like India and in uh, continents like Africa. How do we make a continent-wide app that works for every language in the way that people are used to. Um, it is even still a challenge in the US. We need to localize into the languages that people are proficient in. We also need to keep that reading level low. And this is something that's academically researched for prose in English and in a couple of other languages. Um, I'm hoping that that gets broadened. 
reading level below seventh grade for general populations. And think of that as you're in a general population if you're not using a particular app for work or for your specialty. And then for professional audiences, a 10th grade reading level. So that is if you're using this for your work or in your specialty. And then every element on a screen should have uh, text for screen readers to read. So that if somebody is using it who has no vision or is blind, um, that they can have it read to them by one of the apps and they understand what's happening on that screen. We want the app to be purposeful. We want it, uh, and this is very basic. This is what the person needs to do to meet their goals that they came to this experience for should be clear. It should also be clear, what is the organization getting out of it? What is the exchange of information or goods or services that's happening there? Why is the organization providing it? So those purposes should be clear in order to maximize usability. We also want it to be concise. We hear about this a lot with UX writing. And frequently, if, if people have heard about it, the, uh, they, that's the first thing they think about. Oh, you make things short. Yes, I make things concise. And concision means um, a very particular set of things to me, in English especially. So in English, buttons that have three or fewer words are far more usable for people than longer buttons. So, uh, and I actually don't have data about other languages at the moment. I'm really looking forward to people doing this research and reporting back to the community. And what happens is buttons with one word in English convert the best. People like clicking on them. And in A-B testing, we find one word usually better in almost all cases. Two words do okay. And three words, do okay if like two of the words can be seen uh, is, is such a commonly used pair together that people think of them like two words. So three or fewer words. Also text should be fewer than 50 characters wide. The first time I saw that research, it was for uh, TV screens on the Xbox as people were using it as at sort of a 10 foot distance maybe from their sofa. And 50 characters was kind of a sweet spot. And then I was shocked when the same number came back from research on desktops and on mobile. It seems to have something to do more with how people read English and maybe how many words that is or how many ideas that is uh, or just how wide it is to scan than, than anything else. It's also important that my text blocks be less than four lines deep. So really three lines or two and a half lines people will still read those and their eyes will linger on it. We can see that in eye tracking studies. When it's longer than that, people don't even look at it. They think, oh, that'll be a nice to have. Nobody really meant for me to read that because it's so long. So I bring that up a lot with uh, product owners who are saying, oh, but this important information needs to be there. All of this important information. I say, huh, which part of it is relevant to them right now? Because that's the other half of concision. If it's not relevant to that person right now, then it has no business being on the screen. The, uh, all of that, um, all of the words on the screen should audition to be there. Do they make sense right here on this screen? The next section I wanna talk about is conversational. When an app is conversational, I am not talking at all about a voice principle of being casual or being like, hey, we're just chatting here. What I mean is that humans' most basic way of interacting with anything is in conversation. We talk to everything. We talk to other people. We talk to pets and other animals. We talk to our cars sometimes and say, come on, baby, you know, get up that hill. So we work in conversation all the time. And as UX writers, I work as, as a UX writer, I work uh, with those Gracian maxims that say the words and phrases and ideas that I'm using right now in this conversation need to be familiar to all of the parties in that conversation. So the experience should be using the language and the ideas that the people using it are familiar with. And if they're not going to be familiar with it yet, to introduce them in a way that is approachable and understandable. 
when I'm giving directions in UX content, whether that's in troubleshooting, how to, or on the screen itself, I want those directions to be given in, in useful steps in an order, in a sequence that is logical to the hearer, to the, the person who understands, who's, who's trying to use it, whether or not it is the same sequence that an expert would go through or somebody who understands the entire back end of that experience. So when I'm, the last category I wanna talk about is clarity. And this is sort of where it all comes home. I want every action that happens in that UI to have an unambiguous result, right? When somebody does something, they should see, they should get feedback that that happened, right? And we do this frequently with UX text, like file uploaded or form submitted, things like that. We wanna make sure that how to and policy information is easy to find, whether or not people actually click through to them. Just knowing that they can find it increases the sense of clarity, which increases their, their confidence they have to use it, which increases usability. We also wanna make sure that our error messages every time get them going forward as efficiently as possible, as understandably as possible, or make it clear that they can't go forward from here. Something is terribly wrong. We also wanna make sure for clarity that every time we bring up a concept that requires terminology, a special word with a special definition we set aside to use that way, that every time we bring up that concept, we use the same term. And then we don't use that term for any other concept. Very important. So those are the five aspects of usability. Let's talk about the impacts of how this works. We've talked about voice and we've talked about this wide variety of content, voice and usability, but what difference does it make? And how do we know? Well, we know when we measure the onboarding, when we measure how many people have downloaded this app versus how many have actually gone through the first steps. We can measure how many actually made it through that or made it through the first key behaviors that we know are important to use the app. If we are seeing too many people leave this cycle, we should be thinking about the content. We should be thinking about that, those get started guides, the first run experience that's in the experience and the how-to articles that should be keeping them going. When we improve those, we should improve those numbers. We should also think about engagement. The titles, the buttons and the descriptions, the game and the experience content should be helping them come back for more, should be helping them complete the experiences they want uh, to be using. This should be, this increase in engagement should be in daily active users or monthly active users. And we should be right in there measuring it with the business, with the product. And one of the key parts of that is completion. Do they actually get to the end of a particular flow? Like in a marketplace, buying an item, you've added it to cart, did you come back and buy there? And we can bring people back to the experience if we see them failing to complete. We can bring them back with alerts. And that is another place where the content comes in and comes to play. Another place is with retention. When people get sort of kicked out of the experience, when something breaks, our error messages should be moving them forward, bring them back to engagement, and our troubleshooting should be too. Instead of just having them say, oh, it's broken. I don't know, I'm frustrated. I'm gonna find a different app to use. I'm gonna find a different game to play. We should be considering how are we bringing them back? How are we retaining them? We should also be using our badges and profile ratings. Those things I talked about before, the sticky content that helps them see the investment they've already made in using this experience. Then another way we can do this is with referrals. So when we are talking about referrals, it's usually a text play. It's usually in a consumer grade app where you have somebody say, uh, hey, I, I, I'm having a fun time with this game and I wanna share it to my friends. And I wanna send that link and you pre-populate an SMS message maybe. And all of that is text. The text we write there can really help. So that's how we measure it, but what impact does it make? Let me tell you about a very particular case, a very particular example. Um, when we have crimes happening, 
um, we all want to bring crime down, right? We want crime to just not be happening. And yet, when I worked on OfferUp, this peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, we had people offering to sell an item and people offering to buy an item. And then they would meet up in these two strangers would meet up uh, and they do this now and they exchange those goods and the, the cash. Wonderful. In a vanishingly small number of cases, somebody either doesn't have an object but pretends to and shows up in order to take the cash or somebody doesn't have the cash and show, pretends to and shows up to take the object. And these are terrible things. And it really happens only in a tiny, tiny fraction of cases. And when that happens, the, the people building the Offer Up app wanted to say, oh gosh, let's get these people off of our platform. Let's make it hard for them. Let's make it impossible if we can for them to use our platform to perpetrate crimes on other people. So we made a way, the, the team made a way to, uh, to report people who were up to no good. So that, and we wanted these reports because we wanted to understand who should we be kicking off the platform if necessary? Who should we be working with law enforcement if necessary to, to uh, prosecute these people or to provide information? How could we help? So we made this set of categories that, that people could be sorted into. You know, they missed our meeting, they may be a scammer, their items may be stolen. And what we found with this is we wanted people to use the incident at meetup line and say, oh, the person paid with counterfeit money or they took my item or I was hurt. This is the, the item that we wanted reports to come into uh, so that we could follow up on them as quickly as possible. We had a special team just to do that. This was several years ago. I'm not sure what their systems are like right now. Um, what we did, uh, what I did is I talked to ops because I looked at this and said, hey, every like the first word of so many of them is they. This is a hard list to use. And it's a hard list to use um, using the English, use, understanding where to sort things. And especially if you're already in a heightened emotional state, if you've just been robbed, this is going to be an even harder list to use. So I had a hypothesis that this wasn't behaving as well as it should. And it wasn't. We had uh, our personnel had to spend hours combing through these reports, finding reports of potential crime in all kinds of categories. So we had a real opportunity to make impact with changing the UX text. And here's what we did. Here's what I did. I, I went through the verbatims of the reports and the follow-ups on the reports. And I said, what are actually being reported here? And what are the ways that the real people are talking about doing it. And I used that language and I used that data to make several sets of information I could test. And I tested six different hierarchies of information. And this was the, the one that tested the best. Instead of incident at meetup for crimes, we more uh, routinely got them in the trouble at meetup category. And in that category, we had um, a, a wider variety of things that people would understand and recognize better. And what we found with this is a double digit percentage increase in accuracy. So we, we had people, um, we were able to save time for the operations department and we were able to reduce the time it took to respond to any of these reports just from these text updates. And text updates are pretty inexpensive compared to any other backend update we could make, even operational updates we could make. We also measured a double digit percentage increase in trustworthiness, in feeling that the site was safe, an increase in likelihood of using the site based on these changes in user testing. So it was a huge impact we could make doing that. So how do we get those changes made? So we wanna make impacts like that what does that look like in real life? Well, here's a picture from, I think, 2012, um, but I would do this again. We were going from Xbox 360 to Xbox One, and we had about 130 settings that people could set on those consoles. 
So to create settings on Xbox One, we really wanted to uh, introduce a schema. We knew that Xbox 360 settings were getting hard to use because uh, it had grown over a decade and more and more things had been sort of tacked on here and there in the best ways that could be done without re-architecting settings. But we were making a new console, so we had that opportunity. So here's what I did. I took Microsoft Excel and Mail Merge, um, for those of you who are familiar with that, and I took in Excel, I made a spreadsheet of every um, setting that we knew we needed to include and the ones that possibly we would need to include. And I also put in the spreadsheet which engineering team owns that, um, which, where is it now in Xbox 360 settings, and what do people align that with. And I printed out these cards so that each card had a separate setting. Uh, and I gathered together here from, from left to right is my designer, my backend PM, my frontend PM, and my design producer. And I got us all in the same room to sort these settings according to what we knew about the console, according to what we knew about our customers. And we arranged them all on the wall. And that is actually very close to what we shipped in terms of our settings. So here were the high level settings as we shipped them in 2013. Uh, it was a column of settings that were all about me. It was a, set, a chunk of settings all about the console and then a chunk of settings all about the family. So that's sort of what we did from a content strategy point of view, designing from scratch. Sometimes what I get as a UX writer is very different than that. I get a screenshot with a bad error message that somebody is mad about. And I say, okay, I'm just gonna work from this screenshot and I'm gonna ask a lot of questions of both the, the product owner and the person who sent this to me and the engineer. And I'm gonna say, okay, with all of that information about say what the person should do and where this came from, I'm gonna just put a text box over that and blank out the original words. And I'm gonna write that text in an emergency format right on top of it. I'm gonna say, okay, invalid request. Actually, let's talk about try again, because that's what the person needs to do. Instead of a malformed request, which sounds scary and terrible and might be my fault, I have no idea. I'm gonna say, we're not sure what happened, but our server had a problem. Please try again. I'm gonna invite them to close that message. In general, as we're editing, um, we're going to get longer and then we're going to get shorter. So as I, as I edit, I want to go for purposeful and that'll make it longer as I include more and more purposes. I'm going to make it concise and that's going to make it so short that it runs the risk of being robotic and hard to understand. And then it's going to get a little bit longer as I make sure that it's conversational and clear. Let me make, let me show you what that looks like. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to walk through every part of this, but hopefully you'll have access to the slides later and can see. So here, let's say this is the original, like we've drafted a set of alerts that needs to go out for a transit system app. And in this one, it's your payment method is expired. Your monthly pass will not be renewed. And what I need to know before I touch these te this text is that like, what is this supposed to do? Oh. It's supposed to help people pay their fare without being embarrassed that they've run out of money there. It's supposed to help them update their payment method because the organization needs them to buy another pass. And it's supposed to reinforce the positive relationship that this person has with the transit system. Okay. They hopefully have with the transit system. So we take that original and I rewrite it. And we often call this editing, but it is really an iterative process where I just try to include as much of the purpose as possible and I align it to the voice with a voice chart, hopefully that's already been created. And then I take the best of these. So this is very unlike um, editing a troubleshooting article or a get started guide where I might work in the same document, tweaking it as I go. This, I'm just gonna keep making new copies. I'm going to take the best of those for purposeful 
and start to make them more concise. And I'm just gonna trim them down, keeping those purposes in mind and keeping the voice principles in mind for this app. And I'm gonna take the best of those and then I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna say conversational. How do I make it instead of so uh, short, how do I make sure that I am using the words and phrases they know, the ideas they know, and keeping it in a sequence they understand. And then I'm going to lay them all out in front of me and say, what are my best ones say for clarity? I'm gonna choose those. And then I'm going to say, great, I've got some good options here. I'm going to present them to my team. I'm gonna say, here's the original message. It doesn't follow our voice. It doesn't meet our purpose. Hey team, here's my recommendation. My top recommendation is to lay it out this way. And here's my backup recommendations of these will be fine. Go ahead and use these if you'd prefer. So here is what I've talked about today. This has been kind of whirlwind. I've talked about how software has always required content from Hollerith's tabulating machine and even earlier to right now. I've talked about what UX writing is and what it isn't in the whole spectrum of content that we, that we have that businesses need their customers to see. I've talked about the impacts of UX writing, the differences we can make uh, throughout the experience and in critical cases. And I've talked about the process of doing the UX writing from the content strategy to the day-to-day -day editing. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to digging into your questions. Thanks a lot, Tori. Uh, we have quite a few questions. It's very nice to see that people are sharing trivia about older days and we have some new folks asking a lot of questions. So one of the uh, common question that is coming because most folks are very new to UX writing. Uh, is it what is it that will take us for some, someone to become a UX writer in terms of tools, in terms of skills, you know, in terms of exposure? What I look for um, when I am when I'm looking at resumes and portfolios and things like that, what I'm looking for in a new UX writer is the capacity to use language in flexible ways. Like you've just seen how I might go through many, many edits of a thing. I might say things in very different ways in the UX. And I'm looking for people who can explore different ways to use language to meet a goal. Because we never know which one's gonna be the right one until we try it. And then I'm also, so that's like facility with language, which is critical. But even more important, or at least just as important, is a sense of uh, where customers are coming from and really caring about getting them to their goal. So uh, that's like the core of UX right there, of user experience, is saying, what do you want to do? What's our business want to do? How can we make those align in the same direction and get you where you want to go? So that's what I'm looking for. And honestly, I don't care if that's in um, example classes. I don't care if you're uh, if if you were originally a teacher or uh, a front desk clerk. Um, it is those are the critical skills I'm looking for. Great, wonderful. Uh, so while you're talking, we're getting good feedback for the session. So congratulations, it's resonated with a lot of people. So there's a question from uh, Tanushri, and I think it's a, a question for everyone. How do you create a unique brand voice for your organization? Uh, do we involve marketing in this, or is it just the information development team that works on it? Absolutely. You absolutely have to include the broadest stakeholders in the company that will be affected by it. So at OfferUp, when I created that, I worked with literally the CEO of the company and the, the, um, the chief of marketing and, uh, and support agents. I worked with the broadest set of people to really draw in their perspectives and give them something they could use. Um, and including engineers, I don't wanna leave them out. They're gonna be critical to landing these things. Um, so, uh, and in the book I, I talk about, pulling in these stakeholders and interviewing them, making sure that they know why they're there and that we're pulling out the right information to then draft into a chart like this and then refine with their input. Yeah, great, thank you. So there's another question uh, around the B2B market. So the enterprise products, it's a little tricky uh, 
to you know really implement UX writing as such because you also have the legacy UI wherein one feature gets introduced and so do you have any uh, insights on how do you actually look at the B2B landscape? This is from Kumari, the question is from Kumari. Absolutely, the B2B landscape is actually what I focus on right now. Um, well, part of what my focus is right now in inside Google, I work on the Google support systems, which are both the systems um, for our B2B uh, partners, um, like our, our support agents use our support tools to support our customers. How do we do that UX writing, I think is the question. And I, and honestly, it is exactly the same. We have to know where they're coming from and we have to not assume, and it's really easy to assume in consumer apps that we know where people are coming from. Like, they're making dinner, I'm making dinner. Great, we're all making dinner here. No, we need to know where they're coming from. And in B2B contexts, it is, uh, it is a good reminder for all of us working in UX um, that, that that takes research and it takes understanding, it takes listening. Okay, uh, so there's one more question from Kamari. Uh, when is the idle time? I mean, just rephrasing her question, when is the idle time when a writer should get involved in reviewing the wireframes for the UX text? Because typically a writer is really involved in the last part when the UI is completely ready and we just get blank wireframes. So in that case, how what should be the writer's approach? So my approach is to tell people that when the design is finished, I'm really not going to be able to give them much feedback at all. There's not much F, uh, impact that different strings can make. I mean, sometimes there is, sometimes it's so poorly written um, that, that nobody would understand it written like that and we can make some improvements. The, the most important time to get into it is in that early sketching, pre-wireframes even, of what is the conversation we're having with people? What is it we want them to do? What do they already know? What do they need to know to get through there? And sometimes I'm the first person to lay out the conversation of the sequence of events, and sometimes my interaction designer is. And then we partner together to say, what does that look like on a screen? And how do we refine from there? I will absolutely agree that that is not the common set of interaction that UX writers have right now. And that's got to change because, you know, coming along at the end and applying a coat of spackle doesn't make for good building. Yeah. Uh, so actually there are a couple of more questions. Rajiv, do you have any questions that you want to raise up or I can go ahead with my questions? No, please go ahead. And even if you go for another 15 minutes, that's fine because people are all ears. Great, wonderful. Uh, so there's great. one question around the research techniques that you use as a UX writer. It's actually even I had in my mind, how do you actually do a uh, testing of your uh, content? And do you really do an A-B testing when it comes to the UX copy as well? So in the very best cases, we can set up A-B testing, but A-B testing is relatively expensive to invest in um, because you've got to be able to sample parts of your population who are using the app. You've got to be able to sample them in a, a way that will be legitimate later on when you're looking at your data. You've got to be able to um, uh, make changes that are so distinct that you will see a difference in your data. And you've got to make sure you don't have too many experiments running at the same time so that you're all trampling each other's results. So A-B testing is possible, but I use it very sparingly. Um, and most experiences that I've worked on are not set up to do it at scale. Um, I have not worked at Amazon or Facebook where I'm really, I'm told that they definitely are set up to do that at scale uh, for every part of their product. Um, so I would really turn to my colleagues there and ask them about that. What I use for UX research is I deeply partner with my UX researchers, first of all. And I, whenever we're, we've got designs um, in progress that are being tested or even uh, prior to the design work when we're doing our, our initial designs um, or we're doing our initial exploration into what do people think about this? I listen to the words that the people are using. I listen very deeply to how people are responding in interviews and the language they're using there, because that is the language I will be using later in those experiences to, to rewrite them or to write them from scratch. 
Um, so using that is, is incredibly important. And we're actually about to study voice for a new, um, a new project. And we will be doing sort of a hybrid of, of traditional user research and AB user research. So we'll be running the same survey about two experiences, one of which has been rewritten to reflect a new voice. And we'll be able to see, does that actually work? Did we, were we able to hit this mark where the voice we want to come through is? And that's always like, there's no reason to test something if you're not gonna be a little worried about it. Like if you're sure, don't test it. That's a waste of resources. I mean, it may look good on your performance review or whatever. No, don't waste your time with that. Experiment when you don't know. And you're like, gosh, I really hope this, this meets the mark. And if not, I'm gonna to have to do something else. Great, yeah. thank you, thank you. So there's one question which will take you to the beginning of your presentation. So someone has asked mm -hmm. a question. I think it's by KP, I don't know what the full name is. Uh, what is your strategy when it comes to CLI based products where you don't have a GUI? So what is it your recommendation would be for that experience? Yeah, so I, I go back directly to the beginning of, of uh, what it is that people do with each other and that's the conversation part. So in a command line interface, people are going to be still having a conversation, right? Like you'll probably be checking on the status of a thing and then putting in another command to take it to the next step. You probably want some indication that that next step worked. You know, unlike some Linux commands that my dad is like, oh yeah, just do it this way, Tor, that'll be fine. And I'm like, dad, I did that and nothing came back to me. He's like, oh no, it's fine. It's doing that in the back end. And that's where I know that that CLI needs, and it's usually for something he wrote, let me be clear, that CLI needs some feedback. It needs to be adhering to those same principles of clarity, of purposefulness, of concision. Well, the concision ones are a little bit different because you're not hitting any buttons, but it still needs to be relevant. I'm, for any of us who have used CLIs, we know that sometimes it's telling us things and we're like, why would you tell me that right now? Should I write it down? Because mm. it's gonna scroll up and be lost. Yeah, all of those rules still apply, just more basic, more fundamental, and in my mind, more important. Wait, so I'll slip in a question which I had and I've been struggling with uh, currently in my organization. Uh, so we have realized that, you know, uh, customers are more confident to click on a link, which is an inline text with a UI copy, than clicking on the question mark. So yes. what is, what has been your experience? Is the experience changing that we are losing faith in the question mark and we have more faith in the inline text? I would, I am hoping, um, I don't know. Let me, let me start with, I don't know. My hope is that um, people are learning that sort of specific to a particular experience. And what they're saying is, in this experience, the question marks don't help me at all. So I'm just going to go with these kinds of links, which tend to help me. And I know on the, US, the, the development side of it, right, making this product, that in order to embed the text in that UI string, that's got to be upstream, right? That's got to be um, upstream with more eyes on it. People have reviewed that text. People have said, oh yeah, we really do need to give them more help right here and let's click through and that's been checked. And yeah. it is cheaper usually in the way these things, in my experience and how these have been architected to put in the question mark later and those don't get as much scrutiny and they don't get as much help. So we have trained people that the question marks are leading to less useful things. If yeah. we train people the other direction, they will learn otherwise. I mean, that's that's really the basic of it. Wonderful. I have another question from someone uh, around the editing process. Uh, so how do you actually strike a balance in the editing process? Because when you show like multiple copies and it goes to the edit, so how do you actually strike a balance when it comes to editing? Strike a balance between um, quantity of, of them or straight so balance from one state to the another. So when I create the first copy and I create the second and I create the third, so how do you strike a balance of that? So what I'm doing when I create multiple copies of them is I'm trying to exhaust myself for all of the ideas I might have, whether they're good ideas or bad ideas, I want to get them all out on the paper. And in general, 
I can't make 27 copies of every separate string on every separate screen. But I do, uh, with practice, I do understand my own level of exhaustion with, I have come up with every idea I can for this screen or for this circumstance. And that's when I then step back and say, yep, that's as good as it's gonna get right now. In the absence of additional data or feedback, um, there is definitely time, there are definitely times when I um, present my best options and then I hear from an engineer or product owner or designer saying, or a researcher saying, hey, have you considered this set of ideas? And I'll say, I'll be right back. Let me go back to that drawing board. So that balance is really, how do you know when the design is good? And that is a key question at the heart of UX. And what I say is, is it meeting all of these criteria? Do we know that it's accessible, purposeful, clear, conversational, concise? Do we know that it's hitting the voice principles? Well, we also know that there's a nearly infinite way to do that in English. So let's choose one and move on. That's where my balance comes in. Great. I think I'll just have a concluding uh, a couple of questions because everyone is going to wake up tomorrow morning with this question. What is the first step that I have to take to become a UX writer? That's why Amit Yadav. And are there any courses that you would recommend that someone could take to really start exploring the subject of UX writing? And I had one more that I want to add on my end. Do you also think that a UX writer really makes the UI speak? So, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me take the, the, I'll take them in order. Um, there are great uh, classes out there and I say they're great, uh, not because I have examined their curriculum, so I can't, endorse them on that criteria, but I can say that people have come out of them and gotten jobs in the field and are um, happy professionals doing their work. So the, they are working. Um, there are also people who are translating their current knowledge and saying, hey, I can do this. And sometimes they need a portfolio piece or something else to work on. And I direct them to their local civic infrastructure online and say like, for, for my classes that I've taught in the Seattle area, I've used our bus system and our, our um, like, how do you pay the tolls on the road? You get a little sensor for your car and its website is terrible. And so we take these terrible websites as case studies and say, what would it take to improve them just using writing and make that into a case study, put that on your website, um, these, Public infrastructure can use that kind of scrutiny and we become better citizens when we provide that kind of scrutiny. Um, so that, that is a uh, sort of solid recommendation of getting started there. And then your question, remind me of your question again, I apologize. Is it a UX writer's job to make the UI actually speak to the user? Yeah, I would say it is everybody in UX, everybody who is making that product should be focused on how do we communicate this to the user? When there's a UX writer involved, um, the phrase is our butts are on the line. That is our responsibility. But yeah. everybody is involved in doing it. And frequently the best string has come from another place, but it's my job to recognize that and to say thank you very much to that person who came up with that string and to make yeah. sure it is how it, we, we want it in the product. Great, yeah. thank you, Tori. So Rajiv, over to you for the concluding questions, if you have any. Uh, Hemant, I guess there are uh, two or three questions that you can take still, and then we can uh, close in another five minutes, maybe, unless uh, Tori wants to close. Tori, are you fine to go for another five minutes? I am, I am fine to go for another yeah, few Hemant, minutes. maybe you can take the last questions. You should be asking. Yeah, that is one very interesting question. It's by an anonymous attendee. I quite like the question because yeah. I had some issues and Rajiv was part of that entire journey. What are your thoughts on the Google's new logos with regards to the UX? <laughs> you mean that, are we talking about the new logos for like Google Drive and Mail yes. and things like that? I will say that I personally, um, I saw them out of context first and, and I saw that these were coming. And from a UX perspective, I could say, this is a great brand update, right? Like it is recognizably the brand and it is, uh, and it immediately makes the older ones look dated next to them. That's really amazing. And then I saw them in context in my Chrome bar and I couldn't recognize anything and I didn't know where to click anymore. 
So I am mostly getting better at knowing where to click on things, but it is a learning curve. And I think it's a great way for us inside of Google. Um, and, and I heard about this from people all over the company having that difficulty. Um, it is a great way for us to remember that every time we introduce a change, we are affecting our users and affecting their prior learning and their confidence and, and their rapidity, all of the things about usability. Um, so yeah, it was a great moment for customer empathy and also like, it's a good update. I know that intellectually and I'm getting faster at using it. <laughs> Okay, so there's another question around the inline links. Do you think they distract the users if you have too many inline links on the UI? And I have a follow-up question on that. What happens in case of responsive design? Because the UI that I see on the laptop, on a tab and the mobile, I want the text to be lesser and lesser. Yeah. So when we have, so let me let me pull those two apart. When you have many links in a given sentence, for example, and I am definitely guilty, especially of writing emails like that. Where I'm just like, let's put links on all of these relevant parts. It is hard to read, right? Because your brain is trying its best to recognize patterns, both in the grammar and in the language, but then it's interrupted by the blueness of the text or the underliningness of it. And so it does interrupt that usability. When we are right, when I'm writing for the UI, I pull all of those apart and I say, what is the key idea? Can I underline that whole idea and make that a whole link instead of, you know, here's some words and then learn more. And then here's the words and here's a link to that. And here's this and here's this. Because when all of those are together, first of all, a screen reader will just read out the names of the links. It'll be learn more and this, here's this. To the person with, who's blind or has low vision, that's just not going to work. If instead I separate those into separate ideas so that each one is not in a paragraph all chunked up, but each one is separate, that can help a lot. And then when it's in a responsive design, this is a really enormous problem. Um, when we're, at, and, and I work closely, of course, with my UX designers on this, and I make sure that the text works in English in both places. And I make sure that when it is localized, it'll probably get up to twice as long in some languages and much shorter in others. So how do I, so I check and say, if it's twice as long, does it still fit? Is it readable at all? If it's much shorter, hey designer, I know this is usable, but there's a lot of empty. How are we doing? You gonna be okay? <laughs> and we just, we check in with each other about that. Great, Tori. I think one hour with you is not going to be sufficient. We're having a lot of questions and I'm, let's leave people a lot of questions. Let them have some sleepless nights. So tomorrow morning, they're all keen to read your book and actually start researching about UX writing. So thank you so much and getting a lot of terrific feedback from everyone. I think your session has resonated across all the people with different experiences. So over to Rajiv. Uh, actually, before Rajiv picks up, I wanted to make a, a small, uh, uh, I wanted to make a small observation. Uh, her entire presentation has been about UX, but if you notice, her presentation has had a UX of its own in terms of the presentation itself. And if you look at her background, she's actually incorporated SCC India out there as well. So, I mean, key attention to detail. This is beautiful UX through and through. So thank you very much for this amazing, amazing experience. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Tori, once again for uh, being here with us. And we are looking forward to your uh, more sessions with us at STC India. And uh, we are looking forward to your uh, reading your second book as well. Please keep writing more. <laughs> great to be connected. Great to be connected uh, through STC India with you. Thanks everyone Thank for you. listening.